Hello. Hi. Yes, sir. Dr. Krishnamurti, uh, he has uh, joined. Uh, Dr. Hello. So, uh, this is Dr. Krishnamurti. He'll be. Hey, uh, nice to meet you. Yeah. Ah, hello, sir. Thank, Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah. Dr. Krishnamurti, I was just mentioning to Dr. Sau that you are doing your postdoc in uh, Singapore. Hi, sis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, which which lab was it? We, we uh, who, professor, which I was with uh, Ramanathan Mahindran, professor. Oh, Mahindran. Okay, okay, yeah. Mahind Okay, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, you can. This start office is session. just a few for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can. You yeah. can start. Yeah. Everything yeah, yeah. live. Hmm. I do saw you many times. I even uh, listen to your talks, professor, many times. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Dr. Krishna Modi will introduce uh, Dr. Sau, and followed by uh, your presentation. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Fine. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, shall I introduce? Uh, Dr. Cho Chang Hao uh, is a received his uh, BS, BSc in honors degree in physics from National University of Singapore. Uh, after spending his uh, two more years to earn his MSc degree in physics from uh, same NES university, then he went on to uh, University of Chicago to do his PhD uh, and did this in uh, 1998. During this period, uh, 99 uh, 2000, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Bell Labs and Lucent Technologies. He, ret he returned to NES in uh, year 2001. He uh, he is now is a professor and head of the department for the uh, head of the department of physics. We authored and co-authored more than 2,000 paper, 200 papers in the field of uh, nanoscience and nanomaterials. He is also very popular in the student community in uh, Singapore, especially in high school science student. He do uh, mean uh, convene uh, many programs for the students at uh, during the summer break and winter break. She is very popular, uh, not only researcher as a teacher also. Now I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Cho Chang Ha to speak on uh, the, the little lasers that could the focus focused laser beam as a useful tool for the nanometers research. So I hand over to the sessions to the uh, Professor Cho. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Krishna Muti for the nice introductions. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. So let me see, yeah. Let me see, uh, can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, excellent, okay. So uh, good afternoon and good morning everyone. Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Grace Namaran for inviting me to give these uh, lectures. Uh, it's the first time for me to give a lecture to such a big audience, okay. So uh, I'm going to uh, title my talk a little bit more uh, unconventionally, a bit perhaps more uh, interesting the title the, to relate to more general audience. It's called the little laser that could, okay? So uh, for more technical term, okay, it's a uh, focused laser beam as a useful tools for nanomaterial research. So I'm from the Department of Physics, National University of Singapore. So what I'm going to do today is to share with you that uh, learning, uh, doing research in nanoscience and nanotechnology okay, can be very fun and exciting. Okay? So the take home message of my research area is that uh, it's simple and yet it's really, really fun. Okay, So let me go to the next slide. Okay, So uh, because uh, this is a general talk, more like a general talk, so I'm going to just touch on different aspects of what you can do with a simple laser beam and do all kinds of fun research with nanoscience, okay? And then uh, if you are interested in more details, okay, uh, I have listed down the references for each of those work. You can read up more and or of course send me email to ask me any questions that you might have. So we are just gonna use a simple focus laser beam for nanomaterial research. What do I do with this? We use it for micro patterning, micro architecturing, micro photo current measurement, micro landscaping, photochemical reaction. So I'm going to just show you examples of each of these, and uh, hopefully it uh, is also uh, relate well to you that you can try it out in your own uh, institution as well. Okay, so next slide. First, I'm going to tell you the story of microstructuring of carbon nanotube, okay? So we grow our own carbon nanotube, a line array of multi-wall carbon nanotube using PECVD technique, okay? So the 
silicon substrate is typically seated with uh, iron catalyst, okay? And then in the PECV chamber, we use uh, acetylene gas and uh, sometimes a mixture with harmon ammonia or hydrogen. Uh, basically, it breaks it up into carbon and hydrogen radicals and the carbon finds the iron nanoparticles on the surface of silicon and they grow a nice aligned array of this carbon nanotube, as you can see in the SEM picture here. Okay, it's very nice. So you like a, you have a nano carpet that you can play around with, okay? Yeah. So what we do, we take this nano carpet and we put on top of the sample stage of the optical microscope, if you can see the schematic diagram here, optical microscope basically has a magnifying glass, the lens, and this magnifying glass allow us to use it as a focusing lens for the laser beam. You see that we use a helium neon laser here. You can use diode laser uh, and it will still work and doesn't have to be super high power. I'm gonna show you a video, okay? What you're seeing on the right is a video clip whereby you're seeing carbon nanotube pointing towards you, you're seeing the, all the tip of carbon nanotube pointing towards you, and you see there's a camera here. So camera is the one that captured the video uh, action. We don't move our laser beam. Instead, we move our sample with respect to the laser beam by a computer control stage. Here goes, okay? The laser spot is where I'm pointing right now, and you see what happened when I play the video. This is in real time. You see, you can see very clearly from the video that as the laser beam okay, is illuminated onto the, focus onto the carbon nanotube, the carbon being black absorb all kinds of uh, wavelength very effectively. And uh, the energy of the laser beam becomes translated to the carbon nanotube, which becomes very, very hot. And hence they become disintegrated very easily. You saw in the video, all this black color region. Later, if you look at it, <clears throat> look at it under optical microscope or SEM, they are all empty space, nothing is there right? because those carbon nanotube become disintegrated. Okay, and then you see that I like this, uh, do a small little programming. Okay, and you can translate something very, very nice. Okay, and something simple. Okay, so in our lab, we always call, uh, make, uh, make uh, the technique fun. Okay, so this particular special technique, of course, is focused laser beam. Okay, and we have a special Chinese name for it. We call it Liu Mai Shen Jian. This is basically a Chinese Kung Fu skill. It's not real, it's just a story, whereby the hero will take a finger and then point towards the enemy and then doing, energy will come out from the finger and strike the enemy, enemy die. So in this technique, we do destroy things, carbon nanotube, uh, but we never touch the sample. Instead, we send a beam of energy, laser beam to the samples. So with this special technique, wow, my students go crazy. They do all kinds of interesting things, okay? So you can uh, create all kinds of three-dimensional structures out of carbon nanotube and create Great Wall of China, Merlion, and Nano, and NUS, okay? And this is a very old work. Okay, I thought I'm just gonna done with this and then I move on to other research. Uh, did I know that I actually will continue with, do, with this technique for a long, long time, okay? So you see, you can make Stonehenge out of carbon nanotube. What for? Well, just for the fun of it, yeah. Okay, do not underestimate fun, okay, being the motivating factor for doing research. You see, 99% of the time of the things that I do, I do in my research is for the fun of it, okay? The other 1% is also fun, but this fun is spelled differently. F-U-N-D, fun, I need money to buy my instrument, okay? Yeah, okay. So now with this focus laser beam planning, I show you the kind of things you can do. Micro landscaping of nanoparticles, okay? So here is the idea. We play with molybdenum disulfide, MOS2. So imagine you take a piece of molybdenum disulfide, you take the focus laser beam and come in and then you focus and you describe some per certain pattern. What you may do is that you actually break up the bonds in the MOS2, you may have dangling sulfur in particularly pattern with the micro patterning, okay? Then now you finish patterning, you take this sample out of MOS2, take it out with the pattern, with all this dangling bond of sulfur created by laser beam, you put a drop of the auric acid solutions. Gold likes to look for sulfur. And so the gold would like to bond onto the sulfur very nicely. You just put for about 10 seconds, you blow this away, and all the gold will try to find this sulfur region, that defective sulfur region that you create, which are the dangling bond consists of sulfur. Okay, The gold stitch, stitch, stitch onto that and form all this nice pattern. You see the SEM patterns of all these gold nanoparticle, which you can decorate on the surface. The cool thing you see, I'm showing you uh, six SEM pictures of the gold nanoparticle on the surface. And the magnifications of all these pictures are the same. See the scale bar are the same, okay, 200 nanometer. The beautiful thing is just by changing the laser power of how you perform this process, you can tune the size of the gold nanoparticle on the surface of this graphene oxide, oh, sorry, uh, MOS2 film surface. So we use it as a 
uh, tools to do all kind of chemical sensing, and then of course it create uh, interesting, uh, beautiful diagram. Okay, yeah. So it becomes a nice detector in terms of uh, uh, surface enhanced uh, Raman spectroscopy for uh, chemical detection. Okay, yeah. And then uh, we can also repeat the same experiment. This time round, we uh, perform silver reduction process. Okay, on graphic graphene oxide film. This is work done by Sharon. And what she does is her silver nanoparticle go through a transformation from silver to silver oxide, then back to reduction to silver and silver oxide, reduction to silver and silver oxide. And this process of reductions, oxidation, reduction, oxidation, always resulted in particles of different size and hence different quantum confinement effect. And this particle bling at different colors. So that's why we call it a uh, nano traffic light. Okay, yeah. Okay. So that is uh, landscaping. I create nanoparticles on the surface of uh, thin film, okay, with the choice of a focus laser beam. I can also do photocurrent measurement, okay. So for example, when you do photocurrent measurement, uh, we play with a nano wire. In this case, you shine light while monitoring the electrical conductivity, okay. So when you shine light, the light source is very broad, okay. So uh, the light will be illuminated onto the wire, as I point here. It may also be illuminated between the electrode and the wire. That is a typical Schottky barrier junction. Okay, so if you shine light, the conductivity change. Where does it come from? Is it from the junction or from the wire? So we use a focus laser beam now. We have a you see the picture electrode, and there is a nano wire that is in contact with the electrode. We can choose to illuminate our laser light onto the junction, or onto the nano wire itself. In this case the response that you measure will come primarily from, you know whether the response come from the contact or come from the, the nano wire itself. So is it intrinsic behavior or due to the junction formation? Okay, so with this technique, we, uh, we collaborated with Professor Andrew V. Okay, so who is the first speaker for today's sessions. Okay, uh, and uh, we work on this particular system called single wall carbon nanotube, cover half of it, okay, using ion to open up the single wall carbon nanotube, become a graphene nano ribbon. So this is a very interesting material system, okay. Wei Da Cheng is the one who lead this project, okay. And you have literally a junction of single wall carbon nanotube and graphene nano ribbon. And when we do this focus fo photo current measurement, and true enough, we find that most of the response come from the graphene nano ribbon and single wall carbon nanotube junction, okay. So you can measure those behavior this way. Yeah. So that is the story for uh, photo current measurement. You can use this focus laser beam as a way to do localized chemical modification. Now I'm a physicist, so I'm not a chemist, okay? but you can try to use this focus laser beam as a mean to tune the chemical stoichiometry of your nanomaterial system. Okay? So what do we try? We play with this particular system called CDSSE, so the ternary compound, okay? it's actually nano wire form. And my students Jim Peng, learn to grow them with good control of the chemical stoichiometry. This is a very interesting system. If you have pure CDS, you look at it, it looks like yellowish color. Pure CDS, it looks like more dark brown color. And if you can tune the relative compositions of sulfur and selenium, see, CDS X, SE1 minus X, X being from zero to one. So you can have different percentage of sulfur and selenium in this case. And the beautiful thing is that cadmium sulfur has a band gap, cadmium selenium has a different band gap, and anything in between has a tunable and engineerable band gap. So that's why the photo color, uh, photo luminescence shows up very nicely in this particular manner. It has different color as well. Okay, so what do we do? Anything in our lab, we always go to the focus laser beam. So we use the focus laser beam to try to modify and then create a pattern. And the top picture here show the SEM pictures of the CDS SE nano belt. Okay, after laser patterning, nothing special. Bottom picture, if you now use a fluorescence microscope, shine ultraviolet, for example, onto this sample and it will go through some photophorescence process and it emits fluorescence light. And beautifully, you see, it shows a very nice orange color, okay? And we thought we just destroyed the nano wire. It's not true, you see? You see this particular uh, sample of CDSSE, bottom row, B row is the fluorescence microscope image. These are all fluorescence uh, imaging, okay? The color of the original nano wire is orange, okay? But after laser modification with different power, you see, you can tune from red to dark red. So what is going on? The wire is CDSSE. So the moment you shine the laser beam into, and we have uh, data to suggest that, oh, what you do is that you are actually tuning the sulfur selenium proportion in this particular material system. And since the band gap of this material system is a sensitive function to the relative proportion of sulfur and selenium, 
when you use a laser beam to locally change the chemical composition ratio of sulfur and selenium, you change the band gap. Hence, you change its color of fluorescence in this way. Okay? So this is a very nice way of a photochemical reaction. Okay? And we also use this particular technique to do some modifications of chemical stoichiometry of reward, recover carbon black. Very cheap and economical material. Okay? And it looks black, okay? but when you use a laser beam to focus on it, you see this work from uh, Sharon. Okay. It generates very beautiful fluorescence color because the recover carbon black is just, you know, uh, we buy it off the shelf very cheap, okay, consider a lot of contamination. <clears throat> so the idea is uh, if you have a trace element of zinc, calcium, silicon embedded in it, you can generate oxide form. But what happens is carbon is in abundance in this matrix system. You can incorporate carbon atom into the meat gap state. So you create all kinds of fluorescence level. Okay, you can tune this color, create beautiful butterfly uh, fluorescence pattern just by a nice control of the laser beam. This is work done by Sharon uh, on the cover of uh, Nano Research. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's small scale. We are trying to scale it up. It can be go up to a few millimeter size. Okay, yeah. So uh, I'm going to switch gear now to show you that this particular focus laser beam is also very useful for 2D materials. Okay, photochemical reactions of a 2D material. Why is 2D material exciting? So uh, Professor Andrew we earlier on also have talked about the magnetic properties in 2D material. And we know that the 2D material is exciting in the sense that the band gap, the energy band diagram of the 2D materials will change just because of the number of layers. Okay? So we know that MOS2, okay, if you have more than one layer, okay, you are having this particular indirect band gap materials. But when you tune it down to one layer, it becomes a direct band gap material and with very strong emissions of fluorescence color. So now what we did, we take CVD grown MOS2 film with, let's say, a few layers. We can use a laser beam now to locally trim the local region from a few layers to down to a mono layer, of course, very carefully. And this allows us to achieve a junction whereby it's, on the left side is four layers, right side is one layer. Okay, so for example, okay, so here is our MOS2. It's so nicely grown, you cannot see it. So we use a pen knife to scratch some uh, scratch. So you can see that there's nothing there, then MOS2. And we do the characterizations. Yes, AFM measures there's one mono layer in one case, and then uh, there's a four layers in the other case. Raman tells you what happened. Okay, fluorescence uh, for multiple layer, not strong. Mono layer, very strong, okay? And we can do laser patterning, see? So every student have their favorite pattern to pattern, okay? And then, and now I want to show you this picture. Here is a picture of two electrodes. In the middle, you can't see clearly, it's actually MOS2. And Jinpeng used laser beam to modify the MOS2 on the right-hand side to trim it down from four layers to one layer. Okay, and lo and behold, the junctions okay uh, achieve very strong photo current measure because you are tuning a junction with different band gap materials. They are all MOS2, but because of the fact that different thickness, okay, it has a different uh, band gap. But the details are more. Okay, not only are they different thickness, in the experiment we do this everything in ambient condition so it will actually tune the oxidation process of this particular modification we don't get mos2 purely we get mos2 plus oxygen okay uh, this one is important okay you'll see in the next few sorry and we prove the presence of the oxidation state okay with uh, xps you see this is uh, mainly pure mos2 mostly mo4 plus state but with laser modification you have a uh, four plus eight plus mixture of six plus state because MOO3, okay, MO takes a form of a, the six plus oxidation state. Okay. And we can go from one to another. Okay. This is a story of uh, WSE2. There are different ways to get WSE2. Some use uh, mechanical exfoliations, but in our lab, we use a CVD growth process. But in CVD growth process, one of the typical characteristics of the, w, uh, the transition method dichalcogenol film is that there's a lot of vacancy. Okay, so now imagine that WS2 is grown, okay, and use laser beam, okay, to try to modify on it. The OS grown WS2, okay, has a lot of uh, pothole because there are a lot of selenium vacancy. And now you use a laser beam with a very careful characterizations and systematic approach, okay, you find a sweet spot, in other words, a nice window of laser spot whereby you can come in, you do not destroy the sample, instead, you use a laser beam to warm it up a little bit, and there's plenty of oxygen supply in the atmosphere oxygen will fill up the vacancy. Oxygen and selenium is isoelectronic, so it can easily fill up the vacancy left behind by selenium. Lo and behold, once oxygen fill it up, okay, the electrical transport goes very, very uh, superior compared with the pristine film, which is very bad, a lot of pothole. Okay? So we decided this paper, we call it atomic healing. 
we're using laser beam to heal the WSE2 film. Okay, so here are all the standard characterizations, WSE2 grown in this uh, triangular form, okay? And we can use a laser beam to modify them. You see, this picture shows the right-hand side of the uh, triangular shape, WSE2. This is a multiple layer has been modified, okay? And then uh, we can characterize them using AFM and uh, XPS, okay, to show that indeed the uh, process of laser modification changes the chemical compositions with a lot of oxygens added to the system, okay? And that in this particular case is actually good. And I would like to stress that not all kinds of laser power, okay? There is a certain window whereby this will work well. Otherwise it's either don't work or you destroy the sample, okay? And again, we do photo color measurement. Before measurements, the re photo response is maybe uh, go up by about uh, four times. But after measurement, okay, it, after, after modification, it goes up by, you know, about a few hundred times. So it's very good. And the thing nice is that we have a lot of uh, colleagues in NUS who are very good in the DFT, density function theory calculation. So we always approach them. And this is a team led by uh, Dr. Alexander Cavano and then uh, Professor Antonio Castroneto. And sure enough, you see, when you do the simulations of the uh, band gap for WLC2 with selenium vacancy, you have what we call a charge trap state that is actually hindering the motions of the electrons, okay, hence conductivity will be poor. But with the laser beam, annealing okay, and healing of this and patch it up with oxygen, okay, and then it becomes a state which is resembling that of a pristine state. Okay, yeah. And now we have a story of uh, black phosphorus. Okay, so this focus laser beam basically just can be used for many, many, many years. So my collaborations with many collaborators always started with, okay, what sample do you have? Give me some, okay, I'm going to do laser modification. And then uh, next thing you tell you, oh, it works. Okay, then we continue to uh, go on to the next phase of the collaboration. So we take black phosphorus, okay, and then we can use laser beam modification. If you play with black phosphorus, you realize that, hey, these materials get oxidized very easily, so it becomes not so useful, okay, and degrade fast. So we use the laser beam to intentionally oxidize the surface, okay, so to have a certain degree of control of the uh, phosphorus oxidation state, okay. So, and uh, we found that it is quite true. We can use uh, laser beam with different control power systematically tune and down the oxidation state of this black phosphorus. And then uh, we find that once it is achieved phosphorus state, uh, oxidized state, some of the oxidized phosphorus serve as a protective layer and uh, keep the samples good for more than uh, two weeks, okay, 14 days is what we record, okay. And then we do compare with the DFT calculations, we can actually do a, what we call engineering map to know that what kind of laser power give you what kind of oxidation state of the phosphorus, okay. And then uh, this is very cool because it also gives you fluorescence, okay. And then the modified laser modified thin layer for uh, back phosphorus give very distinct fluorescence as you shown in the picture D here. And then uh, interestingly, when we expose it to ammonia gas, the fluorescence light disappear. So you can have a chemical sensor in this uh, particular modified sample. Just use a simple focus laser beam, okay. And then we move on to go and produce a junction. See, we always like to produce junction diode device. Uh, so P is also kind of a junction a semiconducting device. So we take the black phosphorus, okay. And then same thing, okay, I will show you the next picture. Uh, okay, here, we take the black phosphorus as shown in this here and the left side and right side are gold electrode. And then we intentionally use a laser beam to modify the left-hand side. So this material, right-hand side, black phosphorus, a few layers, left-hand side, black phosphorus, oxidized form, okay? So you create a localized junction that is very, very strong uh, in terms of the photo response, okay? And that uh, becomes a very exciting case. Okay? So, and um, how to tailor make this particular thing into a future device, okay? It will be something that we are uh, exploring, okay? This WS2 micro flake is very exciting, okay? So uh, I will show you here that sometimes as you grow the WS2, Look at the fluorescent microscope images and the triangle looks like this. There's no Photoshop. We did not add any color, any line or any beautiful touch to this. It comes as it is like this, okay? Let me show you more picture, okay? So these are all the triangular shape of our WS2 we grow using CVD technique. The row of C, D, E, F, G tells you the optical microscope picture of how it looks like. You just look at it, it looks like triangle, nothing spectacular. However, when you look at it under fluorescent microscope mode, excited and they all gives out red color fluorescence. And then amazingly hidden within the triangle, we didn't know that there are so many detailed pattern, concentric triangles, okay? So we do all detailed investigation and found that this is due to different amount of WS2. We grow WS2, we think, okay? But actually it turns out that some region we grow WS1.98, some region we go WS1.85. 
different deficiency in sulfur give rise to a different intensity of the fluorescence and more than that, different, different nature of the exciton because the exciton species in this system very complex, consists of neutral exciton, bi exciton, trion, defect bounded exciton, so on and so forth. Okay. So a simple system like this, just by looking at the detailed chemical stoichiometry distribution, allow you to have very beautiful fluorescence concentric pattern in this way. Okay, yeah. And then of course, we have help from the DFT calculation to understand what's going on. We do TEN to measure the sulfur content. Indeed, the depletion in sulfur correspond to the darkness in this particular fluorescent. And there are more to the story, okay? And we, for a long time, we suspect that oxygen must play a role in the behavior of this particular system, okay? So in the recent work, Zhen Yang used uh, CBD technique and DFT calculations to prove that indeed oxygen are main contributor to the H fluorescence of the WS2, okay? It's a very simple experiment uh, we can show you. For example, here's a pictures of a triangular shaped WS2 we grow on the substrate, okay? And then you can capture the fluorescence of the edge very nicely in this way. So for example, here, picture uh, at the bottom row here, but, okay? So you have a triangular shape WS2, and Zhen Yang intentionally used a pen knife to scratch the middle, okay? And as scratch, you look at fluorescent microscope picture, you see that, okay, still only the original edge become for, uh, give you red fluorescent. And then he anew this particular sample in oxygen environment, and then look at this picture. Now the newly scratched edge, because of the annealing in oxygen, also give bright fluorescence. So that gives us confidence that the edge fluorescence, okay, oxygen really, really play a big role, okay? And then uh, we do a lot of detailed research. So the final two pieces of work I'm gonna show you is uh, uh, something that's uh, fun in our lab, okay? We have, uh, this research is uh, using focal laser beam to do micro steganography in WS2 monolayer. Basically, you write hidden message in the WS2. What is this work special? The work special, you look at this picture, it is done by three students, high school students from NUS High School, come to our lab, they okay, spend a time of uh, one and a half year or so, and they are the main driver for this particular research. So we offer this kind of uh, exposure program, research exposure program to the gifted student, okay, to come to the lab and then do research, okay. And then interestingly, okay, they use a laser beam to modify the WS2, original pristine WS2, this is multiple layer, doesn't show uh, promising fluorescent. Laser beam modified give you very bright fluorescence. And you can use the laser beam to write the number five and then five become fluorescent, okay? And bottom rows are monolayer. You see this monolayer WS2, they use laser beam with very careful laser control power, okay? Only modify the right-hand side. Can you see that the right-hand side becomes much brighter in terms of fluorescence compared to the left? The story behind is, again, Okay, local modifications with oxygen playing a big role. Oxygen sometimes is bad, sometimes it's good. So you have to find the tune, find the systematic window of when it's good, okay? So, and then we uh, characterize them with the help of DFT and understand the physics behind, okay? The final piece of work I'm gonna show you is uh, another student, okay? Her name is Belle Saw, okay? Come to the research lab, okay? And then uh, she spray some kind of uh, uh, gold auric acid onto the surface of a WS2 monophase. But it's amazing, okay? So we let the go or acid to kind of uh, find the sulfur and tell, you, tell us where it is, okay? And then uh, interestingly, you look at this picture, maybe I point you to B1 and B2. B1 is the pictures of the fluorescence image of a triangular shape WS2. And then she decorate the whole thing with uh, go nanoparticles, okay? And you see that the nanoparticles, okay, help to enhance the fluorescence emissions of this particular piece of WS2. More importantly, if you look at A1 and A2, can you see that in A1, the interior region of this, the David star, okay, doesn't show very distinct fluorescence. After the gold decorations, it reveals what happened, okay? And we find something very amazing. The gold nanoparticle, the gold nanoparticle seems to be able to find, okay, where the exciting regions are, okay? And they will decorate onto those exciting regions and the gold decorated region, uh, coincide with the fluorescence pattern of this particular uh, fluorescence pattern, okay? So this is very exciting, okay? And then it turns out that what happened is that the spectrum also becomes clean. The, the fluorescence spectrum of the pristine sample shows uh, neutral exciton plus defect bounded exciton. But once the gold comes onto it, you see that the gold patch up the defects, okay? Uh, suppress the uh, bi exciton, suppress the trion, suppress the defect bounded exciton, only enhance the neutral exciton. So this is a way to purify your spectrum, if you like, okay? So, okay.
okay, that is the end of my talk. Okay, and then uh, so I will show you pictures of uh, my group. Okay, and then uh, it's very fun. You just need to give me a picture of you. Okay, the computer will scan it into a bitmap picture, and then it will take over. We can scan the whole group picture onto a nano materials. Okay. And I would like to thank all the funding agencies, okay, uh, NRF, CRP, MOERF, A Star, TSRP for the support. Okay, okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Yeah, there may be some questions. Yeah. Uh, professor, uh, thank you for your uh, inspiring lectures and uh, in informative lectures. Thank you. Yeah. And I have a few questions. Uh, shall I ask you? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can ask a few questions. Yes. Uh, the first question is uh, how. How to create electric contacts for the nanowires uh, with the electrodes? Ah, okay. What we do is uh, we use uh, e-beam lithography. Uh, so uh, we, uh, my students will uh, put the, the wires onto a, a substrate, okay, and then uh, go to uh, e-beam lithography system. So you can actually, uh, you know where it is, okay. So you can use electric beam to define the, the polymers, okay, and then you do all the usual photolithography process, but you know where the wire is, okay, and then you do the EB vibrations, the gold electrodes can be deposited on top. Sometimes we do mixtures of titanium gold, or uh, there are different uh, choice of electrode that will make the contact better. Yeah. So basically, EB lithography. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, one question is, uh, what is the residual stress uh, during the laser re irradiation in the sample? Residual stress. Uh, in the sample, under the nanomaterials, yeah. Uh, 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 I did not show, yes, it is indeed very, very true. Okay, so uh, sometimes when we shine laser beam onto nano wire, which is kind of like suspended, mm -hmm. supported by onion, uh, we do see the nano wire becomes bad, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, residual stress is definitely a, a, a phenomenon that we can see. Uh, we have not really studied in detail uh, the mechanical properties of that, yes. Uh, in the most of the case, uh the sample says oxidized during the laser irradiation. Uh, mm. So do you do irradiation in the oxygen atmosphere or air atmosphere? Ah, okay, very good questions. Thank you very much. So uh, most of the result I show you, okay, when we first start, we always just do this in ambient. So in other words, the, the sample will be exposed to the ambient environment. So predominantly will be uh, nitrogen and oxygen, but nitrogen is not doing much. It's in a, Okay, so oxygen is the one to play a big role. However, okay, we have a small little housing chamber that we have designed. Okay, this housing little chamber, okay, so it's connected to vacuum pump in one end, cylinder of gas in the other end, and the top of this uh, vacuum housing chamber is a transparent quark. And then we can put it on the sample stage of the microscope. Then, since it's transparent quarks, the laser beam can pass through. Uh, so now the sample sits in the environment. So when we want to do an environment control without oxygen, we just pump the air out. We fill it with helium gas, pump the air out, fill helium gas, pump the air out, fill it with helium gas, and now the whole system will be purged with helium gas. And true enough, we do a lot of control experiments this way. When we do this experiment in helium gas, for example, some of the experiments where oxygen is playing a role, this is our control experiment. We get negative result. Nothing happened because not, no oxygen in the environment. Yeah. So we use that as to control the environment, vacuum or helium gas. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, one more is uh, because when you use an uh, Ammonium gas, your fluorescent has become uh, absent. Mm. Mm. So, suppose did you use any other gases also to test it? Uh, it's only work for ammonium or other gases. Ah, good question. So, for that particular paper, uh, that is towards the end of the research already. So, we only tested for ammonium gas. Okay, please feel free to go and try out all kinds of uh, uh, sensing for toxic gas. Of course, uh, design your experiment carefully in a safe environment. Uh, uh, True, Pito, the the mechanism of why ammonium gas causes the fluorescence to be quenched, okay, so it's uh, complex, okay, so you can do a hand waving about where the electrons, creations of electron hole pair, electron don't get combined with the hole and then get trapped by the ammonia, yeah. So imagine uh, carbon monoxide, all these different, uh, you know, dipolar system may be able to also uh, attract the electron hole pair, one of them, okay. And so, so my guess is that it, it may work for other systems as well, so it will be good something to try, yeah. And last question, please. Uh... <laughs> Yes, the yes, as, gr uh, as grown uh, WS2 samples have shown uh, fluorescent only at the edges. Mm. So when you read the sample, they are shown in the interior of the sample also. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think at the edges only during the growth you have oxygen? Yeah. So uh, I think the, we have reason to suspect that our growth chamber, okay, uh, mm. typically we use uh, silicon dioxide over silicon as our substrate. Yeah, so that is one source of uh, oxygen supply. Okay, mm -hmm. and then 
uh, CBD chambers, you know, those uh, you work with it, sometimes you know that if there is a certain leakage, right, which means that the oxygen from the uh, atmosphere can come in. But our normal flow gas during the CVD grow is always nitrogen or argon, supposed to be uh, inert. Yeah, okay. But still, the substrate provides oxygen. Yeah. So what happened in this WSO triangle is that the ash has a dominant role played by oxygen, but the interior is not. We find that there's not too much oxygen inside, mostly on the edge. Okay. And so when we use the laser beam to modify, we further oxidize the interior region, uh, and then hence that also improves its fluorescence. Yeah. Um, good. Uh, thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Yeah, okay. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to share the exciting research with uh, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Thank you Sir. very much. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Sau, once again for accepting our invitation. It was indeed a great presentation. And all the participants were enjoying your lecture. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye -bye. We'll meet again. Yeah, I'll meet you again. Hope to see you all again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. Be safe. Take care. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.